wherever on earth there has been or is responsible government, there has been the conviction that there are unwritten laws which represent an order of transcendent justice to which the actual justice dispensed by governments should seek to conform. Governments on the one hand and citizens on the other have often diverged widely in their understanding of the relationship between these two. Governments can be so convinced that they represent that transcendent justice that they will brook no questioning of their decisions and actions. Citizens can be so convinced that, that, that a government's actions are contrary to transcendent justice, that they feel justified in refusing it obedience or even attempting to remove it. The issue of the relationship between transcendent and earthly law is the theme of this lecture. I will again retrace events in Zurich from 1522 until 1527, as I, much as I did this afternoon, and thereby recover some of the same ground again in a different way, and attempt in this way to show how those convictions developed that led Anabaptists and later Men led to Anabaptists and later Mennonite views on the relationship between divine and human justice. On, on the 24th of June, 1523, Holdrich Zwingli preached a long sermon in the great minster with this title of Divine and Human Justice. The great transition taking place those days in the city brought not only religious but political and social changes to the city as well. When Zwingli preached his famous sermon, the changeover in the city from the old order to a new one that was yet to be completed had gone about halfway. We were at about the half point in terms of time in mid-1523. A great deal was still in flux, was not yet finished. Because the subject of the sermon was justice, matters naturally focused on the role of government. Zurich, I remind you again, saw its government as Christian. The councillors were citizens who lived and made their living there, and Zwingli was confident that such men could be Christian magistrates, while the noble rulers elsewhere in Europe could not, and that was a characteristically Swiss perception. There was opposition to reform in Zurich, but in mid-1523, that opposition came from the defenders of the old faith about whom Zwingli spoke more in the sermon than about anybody else. There were tensions about what was to, re what was to be reformed and how that was to be done. The city council was apprehensive about some of the implications of Zwingli's preaching. In particular, the councillors were concerned about the widespread agitation to end the payment of tithes, which had traditionally supported the staff of clergy at the great minster. Already the previous year, as in 1522, a farmer uh, out in one of the rural parishes had refused to pay the tithe because he said there was no scriptural warrant for it. He had probably learned that from Swingley, who had in fact said just that. And then in March 1523, some of the residents of the village of Viticon, which I mentioned already in other lectures, stated that they no longer wanted to, to pay interest on loans. And they cited exactly the same reason. In the first days of June, there was a delegation from six of the rural parishes and they presented a petition to the city council to ease their financial burdens and especially to be released from paying the tithe. 
they appealed to the Bible as their authority, as they had been taught to do. The council rejected the plea for fiscal reasons. But despite this decision, opposition to the tithe continued on. People didn't simply accept this. And that must be con attributed to the conviction among the Zurich citizenry that, again, that there was no scriptural warrant for paying the tithe. Swingley had said that nothing in the gospel supported it. And it was likely these events and this, this controversy and this continuing unrest about the payment of this tax or this t church tithe that prompted Swingley to preach his famous sermon. Now much of the older and even some of the more recent literature states quite simply that the sermon was directed against the Anabaptists. Well, uh, this is chiefly because some of the principles of the later Anabaptist movement were among those who were pushing for the abolition of tithes and the paying of interest. In particular, Wilhelm Reublin, the pastor at Viticon. But of course, at this point, uh, there was not yet any Anabaptist movement. There were people who were raising questions about it, but no Anabaptists. In fact, these people, who were later to become Anabaptists, at this point were still enthusiastic supporters of the Reformer. And so it's not surprising that we have in the sermon no reference to Anabaptists as his opponents. The sermon was meant to clarify for the council and the citizenry Swingley's view based on the scriptures of the obligations and limits of a Christian government. Or to put it in the words of Stephen Osmond, what role should civic justice play within a religion based on salvation by faith alone? Swingley began his sermon by describing what divine justice is. It is found, he said, in the demand of God in God's word, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount, that we be as he is. It is found in the double command to love God and the neighbor. It is the ultimate and absolute justice. But no human being is capable of fulfilling it, for it has to do, this justice has to do with the disposition. It has to do with the motive behind the concrete deeds that we perform. We are commanded to love, to forgive, to be patient, to give away our goods. We are forbidden to be angry, to lust, and to covet. These are, Swingley emphasizes, not advice. This is not counsel. They are commands. And we are responsible for them before God. But we can never fulfill them because we are all sinners. And so God sent his Son to fulfill it all for us. And we trust his grace for our salvation. Divine justice then concerns the inner. It concerns the spiritual man. It concerns what happens in the heart. Human justice concerns the external in human life. It concerns not the disposition or the motive, but it concerns itself with the act itself. It concerns dealing justly with the neighbor, it, it concerns itself with theft. It talks about murder and with adultery. In other words, it deals with the concrete act. Now he said we may keep all of these external commandments carefully and accurately, but we are nevertheless sinners because we always fail in the heart, in the motive, in the intention. We may meet the demands of human justice, but we can never satisfy divine justice perfectly. Human justice, says Swingley, is a poor defect of justice because although one may be judged righteous before men, 
one is not so before God. But God established human justice <clears throat> because of our sin and disobedience. Laws and governments make it possible for us to live together peaceably. Without this justice, no human life would be possible. It would simply be the survival of the fittest. Human justice is a relative justice, which by comparison with divine justice, he says, is hardly justice at all. It's so poor. Nevertheless, rulers and judges are God's servants, and those who disobey them act against God. Human justice is relative, it is not absolute. It may therefore not prevent or oppose the proclamation of divine justice, especially if government is Christian. There can be no coercion of faith, for government is not the Lord of conscience. But in order for them to fulfill their task, the magistrates must know what is good and what is evil. And this they will learn from the word of God. This must always be their guide. It is the government's task to restrain those who do evil, who visibly prey on their neighbors for personal gain. The government, he said, is like a schoolmaster, and it has the obligation to teach what is right and to, to promote the fear of God and Christian piety. Concerning the tithe, Swingley said that it must be paid as long as the government calls for it. And I suppose this is what the people who were listening to his sermon were waiting for. Since tithes are part of man's temporal life, government has a right to do so because that is the realm of government and human justice. People who refuse to pay are thieves and enemies of Christ. Again, government is not an absolute authority. It does not set its own standards. These are supplied by the divine justice in the word of God and government must always attempt to approach as far as it can to the divine standard. In keeping with its role as a Christian government, taught Swingley, it is also responsible for bringing the right, true knowledge of God among their peoples. While government has no authority over consciences, it has the obligation to abolish any ceremony that is contrary to the word of God. And here we must remember what they had already been doing in terms of, of dismantling, gradually dismantling uh, the older church structure. Swingley also says very explicitly at the end of the sermon that the government must punish blasphemy. At this point, it appears to me that Swingley is in a kind of twilight zone between the external and the internal, and that maybe here we are already in the role of the things relating to the inner man, but evidently it did not appear that way to him. Alfred Farner, one of the Swiss scholars who has written on this subject, argued that Swingley saw the government's role in spiritual matters as an emergency measure only, a notrecht. And when government, and he said, when government intervenes in the realm of the inner, it does so not in its secular capacity, but out of love. And uh, that's, an, that's an attempt to create some order in this twilight zone into which Zwingli was moving here. Whether this obligation to deal with church matters was seen as a regular part of its function, or as Farner argued as a notrecht, as, as an emergency measure, this was the point from which the government of Zurich could justify intervention in church issues in the interest of public order. Although the sermon was not directed 
in particular against those of Zwingli's followers who were impatient to move ahead, he does, I think, include them in his reference to those who yell against paying the tithe. The government has decreed that tithes should be paid, and that order has got to be obeyed. He also anticipates a rejoinder, which was in fact often used by Anabaptists later, that if you justify one item from the past, then why not retain the Mass and the Confession and the whole of papal practice as well? His answer to this was simple. The tithe does not concern matters of faith, over which the government indeed has no jurisdiction. It is a secular matter, and therefore it may, char it may insist on its payment. Now, apparently not all were satisfied with this explanation. Conrad Grable's letter of 15th July, of about a month later, implies that he was unhappy with the decision of the council. He refers to the councillors as tithe fathers, and he says that they act like, not like Christians, but like Turks. Sometime later, Simon Stumpf, the pastor of the rural, rural parish of Heng, continued to agitate publicly for the removal of the tithe in spite of the council's decision. It was in October then of that year, 1523, that there followed the big public event of the second disputation. The first one had taken place in January of that year. The second one came in October. The agenda of this public, big public meeting was now to determine the biblical legitimacy or illegitimacy of images in the churches and of the old mass. The council demonstrated its right to call this meeting and to discuss matters of faith as it had done earlier in January. It, it, the council believed, Swingley agreed, that it was within its realm of competence and jurisdiction. The disputation was called in particular in response to the tumultuous destruction of images that had taken place in the preceding months. The council was convinced that a public meeting would bring this agitation to an end because it would be publicly dealt with and the malcontents could have their say. It was called also to inform the clergy and to instruct the public. Now, when the discussion on the mass had been concluded, Conrad Grable got up to speak. And he pressed that the priests ought now to be instructed in how to conduct the Mass, now that the old form had been declared unbiblical. And Swingley responded by saying that my lords of the council will decide the appropriate manner in which the Mass is to be practiced in the future. And he reminded Grable and Stumpf, who also spoke, that the meeting had been called not to take action, but to discover the truth about the Mass. And he repeated that the council would decide about the when and the how. And the next day, on the last day of the public disputation, Conor Grable again spoke, and he raised points not discussed earlier, namely questions about the chant and the priest's vestments and other things. Swingley responded by saying that everything that is not instituted by Christ is an abuse and must be removed. There was no equivocation on his part. But he said it all takes time. And first of all, we have to preach the word of God concerning these issues in such a way that the developments, that people will be convinced and that the developments uh, can proceed in an orderly fashion to avoid divisions in the city. And then Grable raised yet other matters, such as whether leavened bread should be used or unleavened bread in the, uh, in the Mass, in the Communion. And Swingley replied that every congregation could decide that kind of thing for itself. And to reassure himself, Grable repeated, hence everything is to be left to the congregation. And he was assured that everything not clearly expressed by the Word of God is left to the congregation. And then Grable said nothing further. For Zwingli, the process that had taken place at this public disputation was correct. The Christian assembly of clergy and lay people and council had determined the scriptural truth. The council being responsible for the welfare of the city would determine the timetable 
and also the appropriate manner. And it was always, of course, assumed that, that, that Zwingli was there to teach and also to teach and guide the council in these matters. But Grebel and Stumpf were very unhappy with that decision. Grebel took special note about what the congregations could decide, but what the secretary called his acquiescence after the last exchange when he quit speaking can hardly have been such. Considering that the majority of the council of 200, there were actually two councils, there was a large one and then there was a kind of executive council. Considering that the, that the majority of the large council were in October 1523 still adherents of the old faith, and considering further the political peril of Zurich because of its reform, it is easy to understand the fear of Grebel and others that the Reformation had bogged down and that it might just stay there. They had also concluded by this time that it was that the council was the root of the problem. Grebel condemned Swingley bitterly for following the lead of the worldly government and that his decision disregarded the divine will. To think that Swingley is right in this, he wrote, is wicked. But uh, Grable and his group did not give up. The first days of December 1523, they came to Swingley with a plan. They could do this despite their conviction of the wrongness of the October decision because they knew how serious Swingley was about the abolition of the Mass. They believed that the problem lay in the council and not in Swingley. <coughs> Even though the only record we have of this meeting uh, comes from a 1527 work of Swingley, scholars are agreed that this is in fact a reliable account. Grebel and Stumpf, he reports, proposed a meeting of the citizenry and that there would, once the, all the citizens had met, there would be a call for a division adherents of the evangelical reform on one side and the opponents on the other. And this, they believed, would be no worse than the present since, than the present state since there was even now a division and since there would in any event always be opponents of the gospel. So why not make the division now? They were certain that believers would be in the majority. This is the interesting thing. From this separation, which they justified, which they said would be, would be like the separation of believers from unbelievers in the early chapters of the book of Acts, from this division would come a truly Christian community, and from that company, a new Christian government would be elected, which would then forthwith carry out the agreed-upon reforms. So they had a plan that was very neat and tidy. The point is clear. They had become convinced that the current council lacked Christian credentials and therefore could not be expected to act as a Christian council should. It is also evident that Grebel and Stumpf had no alternative governance structure in mind for Zurich and certainly they did not have in mind a separated church. Not only that, but they assumed a role for a Christian council in their hopeful proposal. There is therefore here no hint of the later Anabaptist separation of church and government. But they seem to have had little feeling for Zwingli's position as leader responsible for the well-being of the city. He replied predictably as he had done before. Such secession would produce even more confusion and division. The only way to proceed, he repeated again, was to preach faithfully and unremittingly, and thus a majority would gradually be built up, and everything they desired would be accomplished. But it would take time. And as it turned out, the kinds of things that, that they were in fact fighting for at this point, they were in fact accomplished down the road in the city and commonwealth of Zurich. But it took time. The dissidents also had other agenda. For now they denounced infant baptism to him. 
as the chief abomination proceeding from an evil demon and from the Roman pontiff. And from this point on then, as I described this morning, baptism moved into the, dis into the center of the disagreement. <clears throat> but in the interval between the end of 1523 and September 1524, they came to shift the blame for the lack of progress in the reform from the council to the reformer Zwingli and his fellow clergy. And blamed it on their accommodation to the policies of government. The next event in the sequence is again the letter of Grebel and his friends to Thomas Münzer. And we note now uh, their reference to the tithe and their words about Zwingli and the council. It is clear that they had been working hard in the preceding weeks and months since they touch on all the major issues of contention in their city at, at that moment. The letter testifies, as already indicated this morning, to the extensive erosion of confidence in the learned shepherds of Zurich. These have adopted or continued anti-Christian ceremonies and usages which reflect their mixing of the word of God with human words. But everybody cheers them on because they present a sweet and sinful Christ. And they put forward a Christian faith that makes no demands, but that which is palatable to the mass. They defend false indulgence and procrastination as waiting for the weak, when in fact they are themselves the weak. The implication of this is that ordinary people can accommodate the changes better than the authorities. The whole thing is a smokescreen to hide their own real intentions. Although they say that Luther has tied his gospel to the princes, it is important for us to notice that they do not say this about Zwingli in this letter. On the other hand, they report that Zwingli and Leo Jude and others in the city of the clergy bitterly and furiously defame them from the pulpit as rogues and Satan's masquerading in angels as angels of light. As for what should be done instead, they write, there is enough direction in scripture as to how to teach, rule, guide, and produce a godly life in all estates and people. There is no need to coerce with killing, which is the way of government. Rather, a person who will not improve himself, who will not believe, and who opposes the word and ways of God and persists in that state, should be regarded as an unregenerate pagan and left alone. Just leave him alone. This view of things represents a radical departure from the traditional Swiss practice in Zurich. It suggests that there are other ways of dealing with nonconformity than false indulgence or magisterial coercion. Now, this is not a plea for religious pluralism, but it is a new and different way of dealing with dissent that excludes action by government and is, according to the gospel, in their view, a responsibility of the church. But there's more. The gospel and those who accept it, they say, are not to be protected with a sword. And Christians are not to defend themselves. True Christians are as sheep among the wolves, as sheep for the slaughter. Because they are Christians, they must be baptized in tribulation, tried in fire to attain the fatherland of eternal rest. And they will do it not by killing their bodily, but by mortifying their spiritual enemies. They are to use no sword and engage in no war. In light of the role of the Zurich Council and of the political situation in which Zurich found itself at that point, these were loaded words. The Catholic cantons were threatening Zurich militarily because of its abandonment of the old faith. Pressures from Catholic forces in the north likewise threatened. And Swingley was especially singled out by the Catholics as the one person who would have to be removed in order to protect the traditional faith. Internally, there was extensive opposition to reform in the council. 
until at least 1527. Now, Grable and his group were certainly aware of these things and of these dynamics. Precisely what they meant when they said the gospel and those who accept it are not to be protected with the sword is not clear. Much of what they said in this section of the letter was clearly Zwinglian, such as the statement that true Christians are as sheep among wolves. But the reference that Christians are saved by mortifying the soul and not by killing the body, and the emphatic repetition that Christians use no worldly sword nor war since among them all killing has stopped, this goes beyond what Swingley had said. Some of this is Erasmian, particularly the, the issues about the sword and its use and killing as expressed by the great humanist in his 1517 book, The Complaint of Peace. The part about baptism and tribulation and the mortification of the enemies of the soul comes from Thomas Munzer. So ideas and formulations from different sources have been brought together here and, and sort of patched together. And therefore judgments about the meaning of the whole thing for the authors have got to be provisional. However, insofar as governments use the sword, and given the fact that the Zurich Council was considered to be Christian, one can at least say that the writers had serious reservations about the Christian magistrate's use of the sword that kills. They also appear to be rejecting any role for government in the affairs of the church or on these inner affairs. And, and I'm fully aware that when I'm talking this way, I'm, using, I'm imposing language on the problem because in Zurich, you wouldn't talk about church and government, but you always talked about the thing as a unity and not separated. The authorities want to become papists and popes, they write, which can mean here only that they want to control both the secular and the spiritual spheres. On one matter they are quite clear. They base their rejection of killing on the New Testament, as Erasmus did, and they repudiate the appeal to the Old Testament legitimation for killing by Christians. They say they are no longer under the old law. In admonishing Munzer about, he is, about how he is supported in his role as pastor, they also reject the legitimacy of tithes for the support of the clergy, which was then still being done in Zurich. They do not accept Swingley's distinction between tithes and usury, the one legitimate and the other not, but by, they simply say that, that tithes are usury. The whole thing is an abuse and a misuse of resources and funds. And all of it is contrary to the New Testament. They also implore Munzer with alarm three or four times in the letter to firmly reject anything that is not scriptural. This has often been identified as a constricting legalism, a kind of fearful biblicism. Now, <clears throat> Grable, uh, Connor Grable in particular, uh, indeed had a tendency to do that, but I believe there is more here than a personal idiosyncrasy. We need to be sensitive to their panic that the reform in Zurich was threatening to unravel. And there were so few that believed in the gospel as they saw it that those who did were obliged to hold a firm line against any human inventions. How else could the purity of the gospel assert itself? Every hole in the dike, no matter how small, had to be plugged. If you and Karlstadt and Jakob Strauss and Michael Stiefel are not careful to be spotless, they write, it will be a sorry gospel that goes into the world. Again, although they appeared in this letter to have repudiated their shepherds, they agreed to meet with them to try to win Swingley to their view of reform. But being pushed in, in, a, in a discussion in, in trying to sort these things out. They are reported by Zwingli to have said now that no one who is a ruler can be a Christian. So the, in the controversy, the 
the, the positions tend to polarize and to go farther and farther apart. This charge appears in Swingley's booklet from late 1524 though, concerning those who pro provoke rebellion, where Swingley clearly reveals his impatience and his frustration with his erstwhile followers. First they want no government, then they do, but no ruler can be a Christian. Now they want their own church, then the government is not to protect the gospel by force. Now all the seducing parsons should be clubbed to death, but then they are to be allowed to preach freely. Swingley is clearly holding them up to ridicule. They have more odd ideas than there are strange animals in Africa. <laughs> but I think that Swingley's words here reflect accurately the ambivalence of these people. Their struggle to get clarity with its two steps forward and one step backward. From his point of view, it would have been the other way around. I don't regard it as confessional apologetics to plead for some understanding for a handful of mostly young men who were in the process of dismantling piece by piece a Christendom that had been place in place for nearly a millennium. It's not to be wondered at that when they approached the pres precipice, they stepped back and looked again and hoped for some other way. Early in January 1525, the council moved against the dissenters, <coughs> again acting in its capacity as, as a Christian magistracy. They were true both to Zwingli's description of their function, that is the councillors, in his sermon on divine and human justice of 18 months earlier, and also in, in conformity with their decision earlier that they would determine what true preaching of the gospel was. There can be no doubt that as, pro as events progressed, the council determined more and more the course of reform. If for no other reason than that the political situation of Zurich became more and more threatening and, and uncertain. As for the dissenters, they moved into resistance in that contrary to their response after the Tuesday meetings when they agreed to take it easy, they disregarded now both the council decree to discontinue their special school as well as the decision that infant baptism was the only valid form of baptism. But even after the first baptisms of the 21st of January 1525 and after their celebrations of the Lord's Supper, not all of Grable's companions simply assumed that the views expressed in the letter to Münzer, which some of them had signed, were the final expression of their convictions. And that's why one has to be cautious about the interpretation of the letter. The stories of how Wilhelm Reublin and Johannes Brötli worked at a non-separating congregationalist church in Zollikon and in Halau, and of a similar attempt by Hans Kruse in Appenzell during 1525 have been vividly told by James Steyer. They were attempting to establish a congregational form of church government with the baptism of adult believers, but also with the co cooperation of the civic government in those towns. Now remember, these are Anabaptists that are doing this. Hence, there was also no consistency in their view of whether to defend the gospel with the sword. So that in these attempts you have, repeatedly, uh, episodes of people uh, taking weapons and saying, we will protect our priest and we won't let you get him. These attempts are evidence that the brethren were not simply separatists and sectarians, and also that they had not yet despaired of the possibility of a Christian magistracy which would carry out the reforms they envisaged. It is important finally to abandon also the, 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 the old Trelchian church sect typology as an aid in sorting out these developments because it tends to preempt the conclusion. That is, the, the Trelch said that there are two kinds of, uh, different kinds of churches. There's a church and then there's a sect and they have different different characteristics and Anabaptists were identified as a sect and if we start with that then we, 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 we sort of uh, give the answer before we've discussed the problem.
Once that all is finished, that typology may be useful, but it isn't as we are working at the problem itself. Even Conrad Grable's words and actions during 1525 are not entirely consistent with the views described in the letter to Munzer, if you follow him around. And Felix Mons did not give up hope that even the Zurich Council would yet do what was right. In his protestation of late December 1524, he seems fully to be expecting the council to judge in favor of the dissenters. Six months later, he defended himself against the charge of having taught that no government was necessary. And this, he said, could never be proved against him. <clears throat> and although the charge was repeated against him again later, it seems quite inconsistent with everything that we know about him to suggest that government should be abolished. He may merely have been repeating what both Zwingli in his Sermon on Divine and Human Justice and Martin Luther in his work on government from the same year had said, namely, that if all, true, if all people were true Christians, there would be no need for any government. He did say at the trial which led to his death that a Christian could not be a magistrate, nor condemn to the sword, nor kill anyone, for he had no scripture to permit it. His statements were very similar in tone to some of the Schleitheim articles of two months later. Well, in March of 1526, the Council of Zurich had exhausted its patience. The external danger to Zurich's life was more threatening than ever, and so they issued a decree that provided for the death penalty for rebaptism. They regarded Anabaptism as a threat to the Christian Commonwealth and announced their intention to carry out their decree without mercy on anyone who rebaptized another person. And this decree was re reconfirmed later that year because the problems didn't stop. The decree was carried out on Felix Mons on 5th January 1527. It was charged against him that he had contributed to offense, rebellion, and sedition against Christian government. His actions had led to the destruction of general Christian concord, brotherly love, and unity. He had rejected the practice of infant baptism, which had been the common, traditional Christian practice, and he had done this without proper calling or request. Four specific charges were brought against him on the basis of which the death sentence was passed on him. And these were first the, the, the rebaptism of a woman. Secondly, in rebaptizing, he had violated an oath that he had sworn not to do it again. Uh, thirdly, he had taught that no Christian could be a ruler. And fourthly, he had created a special sect, faction, and gathering under the guise of a true church. The sentence was carried out immediately, and Zwingli was satisfied with it. Along with the destruction of Anabaptist attempts to establish a non-separating church based on the baptism of adult believers, the execution of Felix Mons must have contributed to what John H. Yoder has called the, the crystallization point of Swiss Anabaptism. The articles agreed upon at Schleitheim, gathering in, uh, at the Schleitheim gathering in February 1527, are clear and distinct on all of the uncertainties of the previous two years. And they became normative for the future, not only of Swiss, but of Anabaptism in general in the following years. For our purposes, we need to look only at Article 6 and 7 of the Schleitheim Articles. Article 6 says that the sword, that is government, is an order of God outside the perfection of Christ. Government punishes and puts to death those who are evil. It shelters and protects the good. Government is established to carry out these functions according to Romans 13. But in the perfection of Christ, that is in the church, the sword has no place. Further, the example of Christ forbids any Christian to be a magistrate since no Christian may use the sword. For the government deals with what is carnal and external, 
whereas the Christian is concerned for what is spiritual. Government uses material weapons and Christians use only spiritual weapons. These two incompatible usages cannot exist in the same body for any kingdom which is divided in itself cannot stand. Article 7 deals with the oath. It belongs to the realm of the flesh according to the old law but Christ who teaches the fulfillment of the law forbids his own all swearing of oaths. Now these articles represent a thought through consistent position on the question of government and the Christian's relation to it. The various assertions are firmly secured in the scriptures and particularly in the New Testament. What strikes one immediately is the resemblance of much that is said here to Zwingli's statement in his sermon of three and a half years before. First of all, questions of human justice are by no means considered irrelevant to these conferees. Government is necessary to mete out human justice. The fact that God has established government calls for Christian obedience to it in all things regarding the earthly part of man. This obedience to government regardless of what kind of government was virtually universal in 16th century Anabaptism. They also agreed with Twingley that government ordered everything that pertained to man's external life, but that the inner life was regulated by the word of God. They agreed that the government bears the sort of justice and punishes whenever there is a breaking of the laws regulating man's external behavior, but that government has no jurisdiction over human consciences and no mandate to coerce in matters relating to the inner life which is governed by the word of God. But Schleitheim clearly parts company from Zwingli when he said in that sermon that government is a schoolmaster who is appointed to lead citizens into true godliness and Christian piety. They also did not agree with Zwingli that there could be a Christian magistrate. Since the magistrate is given the sword to judge and kill by God, but it is denied to the Christian believer. There could also be no thought in Schleitheim of a government seeking to move toward the standard of divine justice since an unbridgeable gulf was fixed between the two. There is nothing else in the world in all creation than good or evil, believing and unbelieving, darkness and light, Christ and Belial. Nor would Schleitheim have agreed that government had authority to abolish any Christian ceremony, nor to punish blasphemy. In short, to intervene in any way in the realm of the spiritual governed only by the word of God. The article on the oath comes as a surprise here in Schleitheim because it had not been part of the earlier controversy. We know that Felix Mons had sworn an oath not to rebaptize and then disregarded it. That was one of the charges brought against him. And it was a civil charge. Blaurock swore the same oath when he was exiled on the day of Mons's death, and other Anabaptists did likewise. Nevertheless, its inclusion here is consistent with Article 6 and Article 4 on separation, inasmuch as the oath had to do again with the externals of life. The judgment made by John Yoder in 1961 that Swingley's view on divine and human justice was, quote, basically the view of the state which continued to be held by the Anabaptists, unquote, uh, can't be sustained without qualification, unless, indeed, I shouldn't hold uh, something he said in 1961 against him. He may have changed his mind since then. There is also no doubt that the right reserved by Zwingli for the government to be a schoolmaster who leads citizens to true Christian piety and who has the right to abolish any Christian ceremony deemed wrong, that this was the thin edge of the wedge which provided the Council of Zurich with the right to prosecute Anabaptists and to proscribe the baptism of adults. Schleitheim could therefore be seen in some respects as an extreme reaction to the suppression of the movement by the very government which professed to be a Christian government. There were some subsequent adjustments 
to the radically separationist Schleitheim articles. Pilgrim Marpeck from Strasbourg and Augsburg took a much more nuanced view of the relationship of the Christian to government. He objected especially to the Catholic and Protestant claims that they were using the sword in defense of Christ and the gospel, <clears throat> and thus justified even revolt against the emperor, against a legitimate authority established by God. Christians, he said, do not fight and kill others. They follow the example of Christ and not of Elijah in rejecting violence and vengeance. There was a certain ambivalence in him about whether a Christian could be a ruler, but he did not consign government to the kingdom of darkness and strife, as Schleitheim did, partly because in his professional capacity as an engineer, he worked with governments virtually all of his life. He argued that to be a God-pleasing ruler, it was not necessary to be a Christian. The natural light of reason and understanding given by God was entirely adequate for the task. And he cautioned his followers against provoking governments beyond what was called for in obedience to God. It is virtually certain that Marpeck swore the oaths required of him until the end of his life. Menno Simons did take the view that rulers could be Christian, although his untempered language against them has a way of obscuring the point. He was much closer to Zwingli than the Swiss Brethren, first in acknowledging the possibility of a Christian magistrate, and second in seeing the suppression of false teaching as a function of the Christian ruler. Likewise, he believed that Christian rulers had the obligation of leading those who were in error with doctrine, exhortation, and like proper services and kind means so that they may turn from evil and hear and follow Christ. He always admonished the rulers to do such services without violence and without the sword. Both Marpeck and Menno were more conscious of the ambiguities inherent in the problem, and so neither of them had the stark consistency of Schleitheim. Now at least four issues arise out of Zwingli's sermon on divine and human justice, and the Anabaptist response which was formulated at Schleitheim. Four issues that I think arise for us today. The first one deals with the sources of government. According to Zwingli, government was instituted by God as a response to human sin. We do not find that view repeated in Schleitheim. In fact, not often at all in Anabaptist literature. It is found mainly in the Hutterite writings, but elsewhere uh, you can look for a lot of, uh, at a lot of statements about government, and that one does not appear there very often. In fact, it's the, it's the great chronicle of the Hutterites who uses, who uses Zwingli's analogy of government as a schoolmaster who trains recalcitrant children. Beyond that, the origin of government and human sin is not often mentioned. Maybe because Anabaptists were always under suspicion of wanting to do away with government, and talking like that about it would have made things even worse. They normally affirmed strongly that God instituted government and that it had a clear and unambiguous mandate. They regarded government as essential to human well-being. <clears throat> that government is, is, is essential to human well-being remains true today. Some form of government was part of the emerging human species at the very beginning. Wherever, even today, people get together to form a community, an authority structure of some kind is devised for the ordering of their affairs. We could therefore call government an order of creation. It is a given of human life. It belongs to that which is built into the very essence of human life on this earth. Now these statements should not be taken to, as a justification for any particular form of government today, nor even of the modern nation state. Theologically, it would therefore be quite correct for a Christian to say that God established human government to act as a regulator between conflicting human interests. <clears throat> 
For a Christian to obey and cooperate with government is an acknowledgement of solidarity with all human beings on earth, for they participate with everyone else in the push and pull of interests and demands and the rights and obligations of citizenship. The second is the question about a Christian government. Zwingli's assumption in his sermon was that the government of Zurich was a Christian government and that a Christian government was clearly superior to any other. It is the government's obligation, I repeat, he said, to lead citizens into godliness. And only a government whose members know what true godliness is, according to the scriptures, can do that. It was a general assumption in the Reformation, particularly in the Reformed tradition, that Christian government was possible, desirable, and necessary for human well-being. But Schleitheim's statement about government was that it is an order established by God outside the perfection of Christ. That was at least in part the consequence of profound disillusionment arising out of the experiences of the preceding two years. Had the establishment of non-separating congregations with the baptism of adults been possible, that Schleitheim statement would probably never have been made. It became normative for Anabaptists, nevertheless, everywhere within a decade. Again, that decade and the four following decades underscored for Anabaptists the rightness of Schleitheim. How could governments who acted in such manifestly unchristian ways in every place in Europe be Christian? How could a government be Christian when it persecuted and killed the people whose one purpose it was to be faithful to Christ? And once that question had been answered with, it can't, it was also possible to provide a scriptural basis for it. There are several major Anabaptist statements which firmly establish that government was never meant to be Christian and that it can be government according to God's will without being Christian. What appears to have happened is that the negative experiences with Christian government and the resultant denial that government could be Christian and the scriptural undergirding of that view took place together as the experience took place as they were studying the Bible together on this subject. It's not that they decided that government could not be Christian and then scrambled for scripture passages to prove it, but that both experiences and the accompanying reading and study of scripture contributed to the Schleitheim statement. It's not really hard to make a modern Christian case for the Schleitheim claim that government exists outside the perfection of Christ. Theory about government and its function from uh, Machiavelli onwards has assumed something like the Schleitheim statement without necessarily saying so. In fact, notions of a Christian government as they developed within Calvinism regularly based themselves not on the New but on the Old Testament models. It came down again to the use of scripture. Most of us, I guess, would not accept Schleitheim's view of separation, which pushed government into the realm of evil, and that, I believe, is where the problem chiefly lay. As I said, neither Marpeck nor Menno wanted to say that, even though both agreed that government functioned outside the perfection of Christ. But the notion that government can be Christian seems alive and well in Canada and elsewhere today. We know that members of a government can be Christian and that they can exert a wholesome influence and on occasion even move policy toward divine justice. But basically governments are politically motivated. They are Machiavellian. They tend to adopt as policy and as rules of action what works, what will ensure re-election what will preserve the privileges of the powerful, and then perhaps also to sanctify it all with moral rationalizations and appeals to God, just as Machiavelli said they should do if they were at all responsible. For all that, as Christians, we continue to say that government is divinely willed. It permits us to live in relative freedom to pursue our personal goals and choose our associations. Thirdly, 
Can political means achieve God's purposes? A question that is closely linked to the foregoing. Swingley believed that it could be done. That the politics of God and the politics of man, to use a line from Jacques Ellul, could be identical. Martin Luther really said no to that proposition. And for Anabaptists, the question, with one exception, did not arise. It was in the Reformed tradition that the conviction remained alive, nourished mainly in Geneva, and transplanted by refugees to England and Scotland and the Netherlands, and finally to America. It is still a powerful force. Anabaptism had one exhibit to this conviction, that political means can achieve God's purposes following the breakdown in Switzerland and that was the experiment at Münster. If we see Anabaptist Münster as a gruesome aberration from some norm of evangelical Anabaptism, we do not understand its true meaning in our history. Münster was in fact a proto-Puritan attempt to establish divine justice on this earth to achieve God's purpose on earth, or at least to nudge it along by political means, that is to say, by the power of government. But it yielded the predictable results of forcing conformity and repression of dissent that we find wherever human attempts to institute divine justice are made, whether that be in 17th century England, in 18th century France, in 19th century Prussia, or in the 20th century Soviet Union. Mennonites today face the temptation to go down that same road. We are not likely to establish a new Münster, but we talk often and easily about building the kingdom of God on earth, and we seem quite ready now to use political means to do it. It's a dangerous road, and we should reflect on it carefully, lest we wake up one day to find that we have come to put our trust in princes and in horses and chariots. The scriptures, especially the Old Testament, warn us not to do this. And so did our ancestors at Schleitheim. <coughs> and finally, two kingdoms or one. Following their experience with the, uh, and the scriptures, and perhaps also Martin Luther to a degree, our ancestors at Schleitheim and later developed the idea of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan. And the church was straightforwardly identified with the kingdom of Christ or God, and the government became the chief visible representative of that other kingdom. And that was, I believe, a very unfortunate development because it provided us with no way of dealing with government when governments became friendly. Hands in Prussia and Russia and in North America and also in Latin America. Since we could no longer place governments in the kingdom of Satan, we had really no choice but to place them now in the kingdom of God. And the old dualism, the old separation had prevented us from thinking politically. And so we had become quite uncritical of government. And we didn't know how to deal with it and how to talk about it. Had we, like the Calvinists, developed a theory of resistance to tyrannical government, even a theory of nonviolent resistance, we would have been better able to make judgments on the greater or lesser degree of justice in the ethos and actions of any given government. Many examples of this from, from the 19th and 20th century in our Mennonite experience could be supplied to support that. I guess we'd have to say that Mennonites in Europe and North America have, to a very considerable degree, become Swinglians. Uh, and, and that's not meant to be uh, uh, an indication that that's necessarily bad. We would have few disagreements, I think, with Swingley's sermon today. It is not so much that we believe that there can be a Christian government, but we are beginning to toy with the idea that it may be possible to achieve God's purpose in the world by political means, and that is a problem. The more the injustices of the world press in upon us, the greater the temptation for a church that is already incurably activist.
The kingdom is God's kingdom alone. And he has his own ways of giving justice to those who live on the earth. We need to remain rigorously conscious of our primary loyalty to God and to the ways of his sovereignty. We need to learn what Jesus meant when he said, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. That's what I had to say. After conversations today, uh, during the day, I began to think that I should really give another lecture here, and that I would give, uh, give it free tomorrow, um, and do a thorough critique or evaluation of Anabaptism. And then I remembered that I had no time because I have yet to prepare a sermon for Sunday and also one for Saturday, and so I can't do that. What I've tried to do here is to describe what happened and why. And that's really a fairly limited objective. But I would not want to leave you with the impression that I agree with everything that Anabaptists did. Uh, or, uh, or even to, ch or to challenge the position that they eventually adopted. I tried to put the best face on, on what happened. To, to, to show that that Anabaptists tried to put forth another view of things. Even if it was done haltingly and, and by trial and error, and, and it, it, it came out the way it did. And I tried to do this for both Anabaptists as well as for the Reformers, all of whom together were caught in a historical situation not altogether of their own making. Certainly, we cannot use Anabaptism as a paradigm for today. It belongs to the 16th century. Our time is different, and it makes different demands on us. But I dare to hope that what I've said may stimulate you to think about these things, and then to consider how we can today best be faithful to the gospel of our God and of his Son, Jesus Christ.